everyone. Welcome back for, I like, I feel like Haley and I say this all the time that it's a very special edition of The Witching Hour when we have wonderful guests on, but like this feels like particularly special and unique. We've never done anything like this before. We are joined by Fazer Kracheni and Jennifer Cunningham who work with the Austin School of Film and are particularly working on something called the Play at Home program. And uh, they're going to teach us how to how to apply some wounds and uh, do some interesting stuff today that I think is going to amuse you. So hello, hello to both of you and a big welcome to the Witching Hour. Thank you for having us. Yeah, hello. Haley, I'm just curious before we start, yeah. like how how comfortable do you feel with what we're about to do? Have you had any experience in this department? No, no, okay. no, no, no. Uh, <laughs> right. No, I'm I I don't even have my glasses on. So how comfortable do you think I feel? I put my messy T-shirt on today just in case. Yeah, me too. We know we right. I noticed that. <laughs> I bonus points to anybody who figures out what junket I go to immediately after this. Oh, it'll be a good uh, collider video scavenger hunt. Yes, you find it. <laughs> so, so to start here, I guess would you both mind introducing yourselves, what your roles are within the program, and I don't know, maybe a little bit about your background and how you got into all this. Sure, I'll go first. Um, so again, my name is Spazer Kacheni, and um, I'm the Education and Programs Director of Motion Media Art Center. So that's like the big nonprofit hub and we run the Austin School of Film. And so I can tell you a little bit about the Austin School of Film. So um, we're a nonprofit organization in in East Austin. We've been around for almost 20 years now. And uh, the purpose of our organization existing is to um, have alternative pathways into film production, post-production and creative media. Our story of kind of becoming a nonprofit is pretty interesting. It was the merging of two other nonprofits in the 90s. One was Austin Cinemaker Co-op, which had some really notable names, and it was a skill-sharing um, co-op that did uh, primarily like low gauge, so like Super 8 and 16 millimeter workshops and events. And then Center for Young Cinema, which was the first year-round film school for youth under the age of 18 in the entire Southwest. So both had very um, exciting histories um, and they decided to merge in 2000 um, you know kind of thinking back to like the 90s and the early 2000s in Austin um, you know our film community is small in Austin but it was even smaller then so we had these two organizations that were doing very similar things that were collaborating anyway so they just merged and thus Austin School of Film was born um, and so traditionally, when there isn't an ongoing pandemic, um, we have 500 classes year round in film, art and creative uh, media. So everything from film production to software to special effects makeup. Um, Jen does a whole series with us uh, throughout the year. And because of COVID-19, um, all of our in-person classes are on pause. Um, and we wanted to be very mindful of everything that's kind of going on in the world currently, not just with COVID-19, but, you know, um, political movements, um, all sorts of things that are happening in our communities. And so we launched Play at Home. And so Play at Home is for adults, 18 and up. And um, we do different types of workshops that are uh, specifically curated to be low pressure, but also... Um, include professional development and community building. So, so far through Play at Home, we've had over 1,500 people join us from all around the world. So it's been super exciting. Like we, we launched this program um, for our students that we have at Austin School of Film that couldn't take classes in person kind of as like a supplement and keeping them engaged and all that good stuff. Um, but what we saw are people from literally all over the world joining in. I mean, from all around the United States, but also from uh, different countries as well in different time zones. And so it's been this like very inspiring um, time for us um, at Austin School of Film. It's just been really great. 
That is sort of one of the few silver linings of this situation is it feels like accessibility has opened up to a lot of people like people around the world probably never thought they'd get to do something with the Austin School of Film, but now we're all connected in a way we haven't been before. Yeah, definitely. That and just trying something new too. Yeah. I feel like over the, the course of the last couple of months, just because I'm I'm stuck at home and I'm eager for new creative outlets, I've tried more things than I think I ever have. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, and so my role at the organization is I am the education program director, but I also lead all of the analog classes. So we still teach like super eight and 16 millimeter and experimental filmmaking. So I've actually been doing kind of bite sized versions of those analog classes through play at home for free or like $10, like very accessible and cheap. Um, the thing that I think makes Austin School of Film very unique is that all of our educators, so we employ 41 educators year round that lead our classes, they're all industry professionals. So if someone is teaching a special effects makeup class, they're a professional makeup artist. And when they aren't teaching with us, they're on set, working on commercials, working with clients. Same with like cinematography or editing, or I myself, I'm an experimental media artist and a musician. So the classes that I lead are specific to my passions and you know my profession. So it's, it's, it's this really cool kind of skill sharing, but like to the next level, you know? Jennifer, what's your what's your specialty? Yeah, so I am um, in in real life, like on set. I am a makeup artist, kind of of all stripes, I guess. Like I work on commercial things where I'm just making people look, you know, perfect and natural. I usually do weddings, not this year. My last one was in February, but I also do special effects makeup. Um, so for Austin School of Film, the classes that I've been teaching for the last few years are. Um, special effects makeup classes and like Faisa said we have a whole series <clears throat> we usually start with that we, we always start with an intro that's like a crash course um, getting all the basics the wound look I'm going to teach you guys today is is directly from that so I know you said you don't have any experience and that's great because um, like we're we design the programs to be for you know all levels which includes uh, an entry level you know so um in fact, one of the biggest challenges, I think, um, that's super fun, but definitely a challenge when we're doing the in-person classes is kind of getting to know where everybody's coming from and meeting them on that level, because it's vastly different from person to person, whether they were already a makeup artist, but they've not done the gross stuff, or whether they just, they're super into horror and have never touched any of these kinds of products. So my, you know, my goal is always to at least for the intro class to to teach the basics, get people comfortable with the brands they trust and and how these products interact with each other um, and get them thinking outside the box about there. There's a whole lot of it. That's very sort of DIY um, for, especially in Austin, like Faisa said, it is kind of a small, still a fall, small film scene. There are big things that are filmed in Austin where people will come from California. Um, occasionally the big thing coming from like, Linkletter or Rodriguez like in town but for the most part outside of the commercial industries and like educational things our narrative you know filmmaking scene is very very indie very DIY um, so you know people will come to me with an idea and I have to find a way to make it work within their budget um, as best I can so that's that's the kind of thing we're teaching we start with an intro class it's crash course our level two, they start to make their own prosthetics, and then our level three, they do their own. Um, we'll, we do uh, plaster, not on themselves. We work with partners because it's not safe to do it on yourself, but we make plaster casts of their face so they can take those skills they've been building and apply them to being able to make like custom prosthetics that actually fit, right? Um, as opposed to guessing and hoping that it works or whatever. So same um, as Faiza mentioned with her classes, what we've been doing with Play at Home is taking bite sized chunks. Um, of like specific techniques that I teach in that crash course. It's usually a 12 hour weekend workshop. So like, like you mentioned, Harry, with like just trying new things, I think ordinarily, even if someone has the, you know, either lives in town or has the means to come, it's, it's a commitment to spend a, you know, a full weekend with me. You know, you have to really either have some time on your hands or a real interest in the topic, but um, it's a lot easier to to try a few things and then maybe when things are more normal again you're you know you're all about it and you're ready to commit to something more um, awesome you know so yeah that's um, that's been my my role with Austin School of Film for the last few years has been doing those in person we just 
you know, transition to the play at home thing this summer. And now I am primarily just, um, like every Sunday we're doing these workshops. Um, we are building up some programming for, for the fall to get a little bit more intense and, and horrific for, you know, the spooky season. <laughs> the favorite time of year. Like an unofficial kickoff for us into spooky season. I feel Isn't like it great. <laughs> It's like, all spooky season here, but this is perfect. Yeah, same. I mean, right in our world, it's the same. Like we're constantly like immersed in in spooky season, like year round. But yes, it is definitely like a change, like a changing of the tide for um, to get everybody excited. In fact, and so for my my students actually come from all you know come from all over the state usually. But now that we've started play at home, I've I've had people from all over the country. Um, because my class is one that requires supplies, we haven't gone international with that yet, just because like shipping their kits would take forever and cost a ton. And so we're trying to keep it really accessible. Um, yeah, and I, I like to tell people in person too, that like in my classes at FaZe and I are the only ones teaching like messy analog, like, you know, get paint on everything kind of classes in this world where everybody else is doing like screenwriting or digital editing which is very important stuff but like we um yeah I, and i like to i really like to be able to get people wrapping their heads around the idea of bridging that gap or like trying to figure out where how far practical effects will get you what you can do with your hands and some products so that you can meet the vfx person where they are and come up with like a more cohesive effective collaboration for those who are actually making films this time of year, I do get more and more people who just like love horror, want to up their Halloween game or something like that. So, um, tis the season. Yeah. Up our Halloween game, please. Mm -hmm. Yes. Before before we crack open the box here, just in general, I I am wondering of all of the play at home options you have, is there is there any specific one that felt like I don't know, maybe the, the play at home option kind of seemed impossible, whether it was because you had a tough time, like getting your hands on material to send to everyone, something about the teaching element that made it more difficult on Zoom, anything like that? Um, so basically what we're, our kind of method, so we have 52 types of classes, if that makes sense. So we have like 500 classes year round, but, and they're kind of sectioned out in different categories, like film production, which is like gear centric, right? And then you have post-production, which is primarily computer-based, like software training. Um, we have not uh, delved into film production per se. We've done like Super 8, we've done 16 millimeter direct animation. Those Super 8 cameras, number one, are very accessible and people are very interested in them, um, both indie filmmakers and people that might just have a Super 8 camera. So that's been one that has been able to transpire onto Zoom. But the whole like kind of mission of Austin School of Film is to counteract systemic biases that have uh, that have basically made it inaccessible for people to access education, right? So we haven't done any classes like one class we do is like intro to cinema cameras, where you're working with like a black magic and a red. Those cameras are like thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars. So even if we were to do like a demo, online, the whole purpose of, the, for Play at Home, the whole purpose of the class is for students who probably wouldn't ever hold that camera in their hands to be able to hold that camera in their hands. So they're, you know, filmmaking just in general is this very collaborative process. So putting kind of film production centric classes online that require access to gear um, is, something we, we won't do um, because it's inaccessible. And the thing that kind of makes our classes in person unique is you register for the class, but we provide all of the gear. So if you're taking a lighting class, everything's included. Cinema cameras, we have the red, we have the black magic, DSLR, you know, each pair of students gets a DSLR camera. If you're taking the a tablet, class, we talked about the tablets before. Yeah. 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 Um, so I would say that that's kind of the pitfall is that, there are a lot of really great classes that we just cannot offer virtually. Editing is another one, like streaming over Zoom, a like heavy duty editing platform. I tried to do it once for Play at Home and I had to completely redo my curriculum. It was an experimental editing techniques class and trying to have like 
Final Cut Pro and like edit in real time to a group of like 20 people, 10 seconds of that lag felt like eternity. <laughs> so I was like, never again. Um, but yeah. That's, that is very understandable. But like, even without those things right now, you guys sound like you're doing a lot. Yeah. <laughs> yep. <laughs> So do we okay. want to do we want to open up the uh, the box? Let's do it. Yeah. All right. So with all of our special effects classes and other uh, specialty classes, we craft together a creative media box. So in your box, it's a bunch of special effects tools that we'll actually be learning hands on with today. And so I'll just turn it over to Jennifer since she mm -hmm. is the knowledgeable one about all the supplies. <laughs> Yay, except for like the first few items, which is like, <laughs> um, honestly, like because of the, the nature of our like pandemic response, like I wouldn't have even seen these items had I not had to have one of the kids shipped to me <laughs> last, last month. Um, but you have like a, a sticker and a makeup bag. And within that bag, there should be also like a, an additional plastic bag for liquidy items. Look at your cool stickers, They're, like holographic. <laughs> All right, love I'm it. Sorry. Don't look at my nails. Over. And a pill and a pen. I I am only. This is like first week in months that I've been okay with my, my nails. So please look at mine instead. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, so you have some cool Austin Austin School of Film swag in there, and then a bunch of products. Now, um, we went ahead and gave you guys both colors, correct, of the latex and the scar wax. Just um, so we usually ask. Um, upon registration, whether A, um, the registrant has uh, latex allergy, and B, for their skin tone. Um, so the Scar Wax, which is by Ben Nye, this is what the giant tub looks like that I carry around with me. You guys should have little, a light one and a dark one. This one's the Fair. Um, so it's probably, it may not be a perfect match for your skin. The goal was for us to get it close to your skin in case, you know, because again, we are working with people all over the place that are coming from all kinds of different backgrounds. So we didn't, we, we didn't want to use like a clear latex or clear wax and have you completely stuck with trying to do all of the foundation yourself, which is generally what would happen. So Ben Nye, great brand. This, uh, this wax is much more like a, like a putty. Some other scar waxes out there are more like true wax like. Um, Marons is one I can think of in particular. But I love this stuff. We use this, we will be using this to build up the outside of the wound, but this is the same thing you would use to make like a scar or a lump on a, a wart on a witch nose or something like that. Um, and so you guys should have two colors in that. Then we have Maron liquid latex. Here's my giant bottle of that. So, and this one's also the. Mine's a light flesh, uh, same thing. They have a variety of different colors. We've been offering our students light or dark just to keep it simple. And then um, if you find that it's a dra that these products are drastically different from your skin tone, once we've built up, if you have like foundation or something or concealer that you would like to use on your skin, like on top of your product, that's acceptable as well, but not required. Um, good Is stuff, Maron uh, and Ben I. Sorry, go ahead. I have a quick question. Is there yeah. any sort of like concealer, like let's say it's oil-based or water-based that you shouldn't use on top of this stuff? That's a great question. I, you know what, I don't believe so. We are going to powder everything. Um, as latex in particular, we're going to powder it once it's dry. So that kind of creates a barrier so that just about anything will stick to it. Gotcha. Um, Hmm. Yeah. And I know that actually both oil and water-based products are acceptable for like lubricating your fingers when we're working with this wax in particular, not all of them are that way. And if there would ever be a reaction, um, it would be with the wax, the latex, you should be good to go. I don't believe it'll break it down. Um, especially because your concealers are like meant to stick right to your face. So, um, that is a great question. <laughs> Also, I'll have to I'll have to factor that in going forward, like when I'm talking to people about their about their options. Yeah, and then I have my like little thing the way that you guys have like little containers. I will go ahead and warn you that um, you're gonna want to keep your lid like closed. I like to pop everything open as we're going through this, just so that you're not fumbling around trying to unscrew things with nasty hands and it's not working. But 
you do want to keep your lid like uh, loose in it and then just keep it on top for your latex. Um, that's the most sensitive thing that you have. And once it starts to dry, it is like useless. So it, it'll be trash. So we just want to keep it like not exposed to air, but easily accessible. All right. You guys have a small batch of fake blood. Here is my almost empty giant, like very well loved, used a whole lot <laughs> version of the same product. Um, hogs blood. It's not made of hogs. Um, by the way, it's vegan and it is, um, this is actually created by a, an Austin based FX shop who, um, so we like to, we like to support local. Um, it's great stuff. It's a nice, as you can see from the dried blood on the bottle, it's a kind of, it's a nice realistic color as opposed to some like cheaper bloods you would get. They're like just crazy bright red and ridiculous. And this will dry. It's a liquid that's going to dry as opposed to a lot of bloods are syrup based. Sometimes it, you, Neither is necessarily superior overall. Um, I do like this because it will not be just like this gargantuan sticky mess. You can choose like if you want to put something on it to make it goopy, but um, hog's blood. And then you should also have a nice brand new bottle of hog wash. <laughs> you should also have a small batch of this lavender soap formulated with a chemist and the same FX makeup artist. Um, at Hogfly Productions made the blood. So this is made for taking the blood off of your skin. Um, the blood will stain clothes, but it will, this will help keep it off, take it off of your skin when you're done. You'll just use that like a regular, any other facial soap like lather and rinse. Um, and it's really great stuff. So made for taking off blood stains as well as some of the makeup. So you should also have a bruise wheel. This is made also by Maron. Got five colors in here. These are all really great. One of the first things that we cover when we're doing my in-person classes is just like the anatomy of a bruise and like what colors are in it, depending on how old it is and what your body is, you know, going through that makes it look that way. But we're going to be using it both for a little bit of bruising and trauma, as well as any painting we mm -hmm. want to do, which is part of how we keep your kit small and affordable as, as opposed to having <laughs> some like separate makeup or body paint. Um, so it's a cream makeup which makes it pretty much infinitely blendable, which is also, uh, which is also nice. So this is a, and this is full size. Like obviously we gave you small portions of a lot of the other things. This bruise wheel will last you like for Halloween's to come. Um, so you might just think of ways that you can be using this going forward. Um, you should also have powder, which is just baby powder. <clears throat> I think we got a nice smell for you there as well. We're going to be using that powder for setting our products always Aww. after they dry, um, both our wax and our latex and um, a brush for that. <laughs> so we also, again, we want to keep that brush dry, right? Um, and we're just going to be using it for, for dusting over the top of our makeup. I mean, over the top of our um, latex and wax. And then you should also have a couple of stipple sponges. I have cut I have one that I've cut here. Um, I actually just came off of a job yesterday and all my favorite sponges are currently wet because I just cleaned them. <laughs> so these guys are great. Um, you should have two bigger ones. This is like half of one. If you've never used a stipple sponge, I'll show you real quick like what, why we're using this. Um, just even for just making bruises, like it's, it's really an essential tool. But when we just dab that on, we get this really great texture that saves like, so much time as opposed to trying to do all of that with a little brush or something, right? So it's really going to be great for, you can see in our student looks that are on the screen next to the list, um, any bruising, any trauma around their wounds that looks <laughs> like nice and rough and natural and organic, that was all done using stippling and the bruise wheels. So um, for an example of what that can do for you. Um, you should also have Q-tips and organic cotton balls. We're going to be using the Q-tips for application, um, mostly of our latex, because you can just throw them away, um, as opposed to leaving you with some brushes that you're going to have to wash or something, and good luck. You know? And then the cotton, um, we will actually be using this for part of the interior, interior of our wound. So it's going to help us get a nice lumpy texture 
we are going to do that by deconstructing it, which you guys can just be doing right now while I'm talking. If you want, I like to be doing that like in advance, just so that I, I have like a pile of deconstructed cotton ball ready to go when I need it. I keep a roll of paper towel at arm's reach, like always when I'm working on this. You never know. Even, even if you don't spill anything, periodically you're going to want to like wipe your hands off. So it also point out that this kit comes with a, uh, with a, cat distraction because immediately after unboxing everything he went and sat in the box so i'm gonna be fine now hey we can market that built-in cat I, I will get you a picture of him in this box because he is yes, mighty handy right now we also have makeup wipes so again i like i would like to suggest you go ahead and like open that up have it just kind of open and nearby because there will be at least once if not frequently during this process that you're going to want to just grab a wipe and like clean off your hands or again, clean up a spill or a mistake on your face. Even they're just really handy to have um, because they're already like preloaded with a, with a cleansing product. Right. Um, and they're wet. So um, while I'm talking to you, I'm just kind of pulling this apart. And as you're pulling your cotton apart, you'll probably see like the more you spread it out, the more you'll see like little lumps, this cool texture in there, which is really great. Also gonna get a trash can. <laughs> trash can is good. <laughs> we're learning as we're going. <laughs> yeah, well, and so like one more, if it looks like we've gone through this list, one more thing I would like to suggest before we get started is if either of you have um, like coconut oil or a makeup remover of some kind handy, that would be great. We are gonna want to lubricate our fingers while we're working with the wax. Water will work, if not, um, with this particular kind of wax, but I always like to have coconut oil or <clears throat> I'm gonna do another quick plug for our, for our blood and soap effect shop that we love so much. Um, I have an adhesive remover made also by Hogfly Productions that is avocado oil, sesame oil, vitamin E. Um, and so it's made for like taking off the heavy prosthetic adhesives that we use but I also like to pour a little into the cap and just have that handy and I just like dip my fingers in it once in a while when I'm working with the wax. Um, and so a quick note about the wax before we get started working with it, just to warn you, most people get pretty frustrated with it, especially the first few times you've used it. Um, it will be, um, I don't know how hard it will be to get out of the thing. I don't know what temperature you have it at right, right now. However, it is warmed up by your body heat. So while you're playing with it, it's going to get like more malleable, which is great until it's not right. <laughs> there will be moments where you might feel like it's too sticky. And I advise at that time to like clean your hands off, just stop touching it for a minute, you know, and then maybe like lube the finger before touching it again. So that happens. Nothing is wrong with you if that happens to you. It's super normal. The stuff really does a great job, but can be frustrating to work with. So be aware. So the blood I showed you before is a liquid. Um, it, it, if you ever need to, to create like a, a blood rig that sprays or anything, it can actually be thinned down with water too to go through tubing. Scabby blood is going to be well, just like it sounds. Like it's goopy. It's textured. It's going to look really great inside of a wound. So... You've got some options. Um, so is the scabby blood the one you were talking about that doesn't dry up so much? Yeah, you know, it, it will also, because it is based on the same like blood, it will dry up for the most part. It's going to be like more smushy and gelatinous, but it's still like, what I mean specifically is that some bloods are syrup based. Like the first ingredient is syrup. In fact, when we make our own blood in class, we use corn syrup as a base. Um, those will like just stay infinitely sticky and it's a terrible mess if it spills <laughs> and everything else. So the scabby blood might take a little longer to dry, um, but it should still dry up for the most part. It will look a little bit more wet once it's dry. Like it maintains that sheen a little bit better. Yeah. I, t I definitely encourage you guys to play with both of them even beyond today. So um, yeah, there's a picture. So these two looks at the bottom are closest, cl like closest to what we're, the technique that we're going to explore. Um, these are all student looks, by the way. So when we do our in-person classes, we have a photographer come in on day two. Um, 
for some classes we have that we provide models so that they can get the experience of like working on someone else as opposed to themselves and how to communicate with another person about their comfort level and all that um especially for those interested in actually like doing makeup on and film you have to know how to talk to people um very different than just doing your own you know and i was just going to ask you jen let's yeah. say somebody's trying this at home and they oopsie and they do get a little in their hair what's their best bet i would suggest letting it dry and then like like i mentioned coconut oil as a good lubricant that's also a decent remover so I, I recommend that you let, that they let it dry and then like very carefully kind of saturate that air. Like say if I got it right here, I'm just, I don't know, showing. Like I would just like saturate that area with a cotton ball or a Q-tip, however big, um, so that you get the oil under the latex as best you can. That will help loosen it. Mm -hmm. um, but I would definitely like let it dry first. I don't believe you're gonna have a lot of luck trying to like scrub it off while it's still wet. and it, it only takes a few minutes to dry. But it's a more positive um, answer than just saying like, wear a hat. Shave it. Shave your head. Shave it off. There yeah. are I had an oopsie once. I'll say um spirit gum is another really common. Like we we're using latex as a combo adhesive and like texturing agent can create a false skin. Um so that's part of why we're including it in this kit is simply like it it multitasks and it's a really common tool. However, um, like spirit gum is a really common one as well as prose that you would only use as an adhesive underneath say wax or underneath the prosthetic and one time I had a mask on um, on my I did this to myself <laughs> and not to someone else thankfully I'm very carefully carefully like conscious of the glue on other people but I was holding like a fat girl cowl to my head with spirit gum and I guess I just kind of got in a hurry I got to a point where I was like so frustrated with this long removal process that finally I just kind of pulled and I didn't expect it but I pulled out like my widow's peak <laughs> like, um so that wasn't fun if you feel if you feel something pulling I would certainly like take some time to really like saturate it with some like coconut or avocado oil or if you have an oil-based makeup remover that's probably got something in it that's gonna that's intended to break down those stubborn substances you know um so yeah um that said it's a good time if you have any moisturizer any, any potential like oils on the part of your face that you're going to work on go ahead and wipe that real quick with a makeup wipe because um well, if, if you have any oil or moisturizer in that space it can help it would like it can kinder so wax. you're you're gonna do it right here because I'm just right here. Cool. Yeah, some people will just like follow right along with me. Some choose another spot. If you're experimenting, I like to suggest a thigh is great when you're like wearing shorts and sitting on it. I know not for you guys because we're recording for uh, <laughs> for other purposes, but like a lot this of my students will just show work so on their thigh. What's that? This is a thigh free show. So a thigh free show. Yeah, they're like when we have a class of, you know, 15 people that are all in their respective homes. And so it doesn't, they don't have to show until they, unless they want to. They'll work on their thigh because it's like horizontal. So they're not working against gravity. It's kind of nice. But just FYI, you're going to have enough product to keep experimenting with some of this after we're done. So thighs are a good place to play. <laughs> or not show. <laughs> awesome. So I've, yeah, I've cleaned that part of my face. We're just letting it air dry. Um, and while that's drying, I'm going to go ahead and get out some of my wax. I have a little spatula that I use for that. Do, did you have a little spatula? Did I get a spatula? Okay. And like anything oh, that is. You do? Sweet. Perfect. That guy I like to use to gouge out some of the wax or whatever, because like, I'm using this huge tub. You may also like it for like smoothing down edges. We'll get to that. But it's pretty, it's, these are, they're like cheap and disposable, but they're sturdy enough and they bend really nice and they clean off easily. So even though they're disposable, they can be reused and it's not wasteful. I'm always treading a fine line between disposable is easy, but wasteful, you know, and right. 
right now in pandemic times, like more of my kit is disposable than ever before, just because sanitizing is such a thing. Um, so yeah, I like whenever possible, when it's just going to be you using it. I love these guys. They're totally, we can clean it off and use them for multiple different purposes. So, um, I am taking a little ball of my wax. <clears throat> you can choose the size. I mean, the, this will be surprisingly a lot once we start manipulating it. Um, and I'm just going to like smush it so that I can tear it roughly in half. Doesn't have to be super precise. This wax is definitely very putty-like, so if you've ever played with clay or Play-Doh or anything like that, concept is similar as far as how we'll shape it. So um, in order to do that more linear gash-like shape, I'm gonna start by making two little snake pieces. So just picking one or the other, and I'm just gonna start rolling it out. And once I get a look at how that fits on my face, so that might be a little big. So I can just pinch off a little bit of it. And that's fine. I'm going to put that back in my tub. You can make it as big or as small as you want. I'm going to make mine comically large for demonstration purposes. <laughs> um, and just to go ahead and save myself some trouble a little while, I'm going to go ahead and roll out the other one too. So I'm making snaky pieces. How, like, so many... how Sorry, thick should the little snaky be? Personal preference, really. Okay. Um, I I would just. It really depends on like how how demure and <laughs> and understated you want your wound to be. Mine is huge, so I want it thick enough that I can have. Just keep in mind. We're going to smooth out one side to make it blend into our skin. And the other side is going to be like the inner rim, right, of the wound. So whatever thickness this is, is like the depth of the wound that you're creating, if that makes sense. Did I explain that well? <laughs> um, I am going to, so I have my little snaky piece. I'm going to play with this size. Like I said, I, this is crazy big for like a normal every day, but I think it works for us for here. Um, so before I go to adhere it at all, I'm just going to smush the side one half of like the length all the way down. I'm not too worried about like perfect consistency here. This is just giving me a head start. So there's less that I have to do once I have it stuck to my face. And I still think my snake here is a little bit well off the end of it. <clears throat> So one side is still very rounded, and then the other side is flatter. And your rounded side is going to be your interior edge. All right. I'm still working with just my regular dry hands. They're starting to get sticky from touching the wax, but it's not out of control yet. All right. I'm gonna go ahead and once I, when I, once I have like one rounded side, one smushy side, I'm just gonna stick it down where I want it. You can do top or bottom first, doesn't really matter. Um, I'm gonna do bottom first. And I'm just gonna smush it against my skin. And it's not gonna stick a whole lot. We don't have an adhesive underneath. That is an option if you were gonna wear something for like hours and hours or on set or something like that. Um, I do use a heavy duty adhesive underneath. Did it break? I broke my snakey piece. Oh no, that's okay. It's very malleable. You just smush it back together. It's very forgiving wax. That's one reason we love it. Okay. Uh, right together. But yeah, I'm just I'm I am just kind of smushing it down enough to get it to stay for a second. And then I'm gonna go ahead and clean my other hand with a wipe so I'm not sticking to myself. My, my sticky thing won't stay. Oh no. It's the see, I told you it's 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 frustrating at first. <laughs> it's and it's not gonna like that's that's great. That's good enough. Perfect. So if your hand's a little sticky, I would go ahead and like just wipe that real quick. And then I'm sticking my thumb in my oil that I'm using as a lubricant. 
um, because I'm just going to use like the back of my thumbnail. You could use a spatula. You could, but I um I dipped my finger, my thumb into my lubricant, and now I'm just like smoothing that out some more and sticking it more thoroughly. Can you see like this smushing? Even though I do this all the time, I still have the same issue, Perry, like frequently. It's just the nature of the beast. You can use a finger tip, a fingernail, a spatula. I like a fingernail because it's like non-porous and relatively flat, you know? So it's, it's, it's like having a tool built in my hand. Well, I guess that's what hand fingers are. <laughs> so, um, oh, is it not? I am not sticking. Getting a fresh start. Okay. Sometimes you gotta start with a new snaky thing. New snaky thing. I, I'm not smiling because I'm angry. I'm just trying not to make it fall off. <laughs> that's a good idea. Um, One side only. Totally good idea. The very first play at home, the F FX workshop that we did. I, I did actually, I used the same student to look as my inspiration and I built off of the side of my mouth, which was a terrible idea because I had to talk the whole time to give this demo. And so I couldn't really make it, it was hard to make it stay because I never like sat still long enough. That's why I'm not doing my mouth right now. Okay, I think it's awesome. like on my face now. Great. So yeah, if you're worried that the fingers you were just using are, are sticky enough that it might lift off, I would clean them and then, and then start smoothing down. Even if the color isn't a perfect match, um, I'm always pretty impressed with how well this stuff blends into the skin. I don't know if you're having wow, You get it to blend so well. Practice, practice, practice. I feel like mine keeps like lifting every time I try to blend it. Um, did you, did you wet your, um, your finger that you're... Uh, yeah, I, I only have water though. That'll work. Is it helping at all? Uh, I don't know about that. <laughs> Maybe a little bit. See, I think when you smile too, that manipulates the, the shape a little. I know. <laughs> I know. <laughs> it's very hard for me. Um, if you want, you could do like, instead of, I know that you wanted to follow along, but you could also do like maybe a little like busted nose because we know your nose isn't going to move even if you're smiling and talking. Sometimes it's just easier to pick a spot that's not going to move. Yeah, that no, makes sense. <laughs> Come on, you. We're going to have to Botox your cheeks, Barry. Seriously. Know. Something's no. kind of happening. <laughs> Hey, all right. It's getting there. There we go. And it doesn't have to be super perfect yet. If you feel like you're able to get it to stay you're enough, to like in smile. You, you have to stop smiling. <laughs> smiling. You have to be very <laughs> solemn. I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah. But yes, moving your face. Specifically, the part that you're working on is does make the whole process harder. You may even want to just move up further onto like the apple of your cheek oh, and do. <laughs> I would I would consider doing that. Like just move up a little this way, so you're not worried about your jaw moving. Like you could do something up here. You might you might even just do it slightly smaller since it's a smaller space. Okay, smaller one. I don't want to get too far ahead and lose Perry, but Haley, if you want to start smushing out the side of your other snaky piece, we're going to do exactly the same thing. And through. Mirror image there. See, this is also something I'm 
learning how to troubleshoot from afar because when we're in person, I can just kind of hover around the room and like touch people's projects and help like. Right. Okay, that's still um, much better, right? Yeah, no, this is like actually staying. Great. But I'm still sometimes, trying really hard not to smile. Okay, yeah, I mean, it really makes a difference. And sometimes you, you like touch a piece of wax too much and just have to grab a new one or something. But great, if you got it to work, so then we want to do the same exact thing that we're going to do like a mirror image and whatever negative space you leave in between that's the interior of your wound so you can make that as big or small as you prefer whatever works i'm going to make mine just like a gaping sort of oblong i'm going to do the same exact thing i'm going to smush it down just enough and make it stay while I then lubricate my thumbnail or your spatula or whatever so you can begin smoothing the outside out into your skin. It's also a little long. You know, we are on a limited time frame right now, but if you guys do recreate any of this later as well, you can really spend a lot of time carefully smoothing out, carving into the wax, like manipulating it. There's a lot you can do, and I, I absolutely believe especially when you're just getting familiar with the product that like the more time you spend smoothing and things like that, the better it's going to look. Do you have a favorite uh, book or resource that you learned from? Oh, geez. Um, I, don't, I don't like to use the word self-taught because I think like that's a lie. Everybody, nobody, you know, we all learn from each other. But, yeah. you know, not, um, not a book necessarily. I watch a lot of videos. I love, I love watching Rick Baker videos because he has the most soothing yeah. voice. Um, I make my students watch Rick Baker videos when, when I feel like we need like a calm presence in the room. Um, v Neil. So I just, I like watch a lot of videos on, on Instagram. Um, there's, I have a couple of favorite, um, like Instagram artists who are, especially when we're talking about like body horror, wax and things. Um, there's one in particular called Rolly Gore, R-O-L-I-G-O-R-E. She's great. And she's usually like almost entirely wax. Um, so I love to reference her to my students too, for like further development. Um, there is also an artist on YouTube called, uh, Glam and Gore. Her name is Mikey. Do you know, she's so great. Um, so she's, she's really amazing. In fact, we directly, we, we use a lot of the same techniques that she does for like her, her prosthetics making and stuff. So when I realized that it was so consistent with what I was already teaching, I started like using those as reference points for my students if they needed to like remember something we were doing or needed a visual, nice. um, you know. Like we use her gelatin prosthetic recipe. I mean, it's not just hers, right? Like it's a, it's a, it's a standard thing, but she's just very finding artists who are doing the same things that I'm doing. And then are also like really good at presentation in a way that's both informative and fun. Um, you know, like in their video production quality is good that mm -hmm. she's top, top notch also made you look, um, oh. but it's like Y E U like the tree, I uh -huh. guess. Um, she's Canadian, I think, 
Uh, but she's great with paint. And I'm a painter. Like, um, I guess I didn't mention that earlier, but I ended up working in makeup um, sort of, of as a culmination of all of my life skills. I have a background in theater and dance. So stage makeup was already a thing I was doing. Did you just come off completely, Perry? Yeah, no, it's, it's definitely not staying on my face. <laughs> I wonder why. But, and so, again, sometimes it just happens. Did it help we, you, like, just, like, actually dip, like, the thing in water? Her skin um, is just too healthy. That's <laughs> right. Your skin might be. So I, would, I wouldn't dip the thing in water because you need, a, we need, you need the bond. Like, you need just, like, wax to skin. And then any lube that we do is, like, on top of the wax. But if it gets, if it's underneath, it might keep it further from, like, sticking to your skin. Okay. Don't let me hold you up. I'll, I'll okay. Are you are you okay with that? I want to move on forward. But then you'll have this, right? So that you can try again? Yes. yes. To reference it? Great. Um, and, and again, if I were doing this for somebody who's going to be wearing it for 12 hours on set, I would be using some heavy-duty, like, prosthetics glue um, that would require a special remover. There are ways if it's not sticking well, but none of them are super easy, user-friendly. Kind of thing so all right um Haley you already have your shape feeling good about that it's a shape it's a shape great so just with whatever I mean I have more negative space than you do for for demonstration purposes but with the with the space that you have um, if you have not have you already torn up some cotton did you shred up some of your cotton ball great yeah. so we're gonna have our cotton ball shreds we're gonna have our latex we're gonna have a Q-tip. That's our next step. I fucking did it. <sighs> you did it. Awesome. Good job. Good job. I'm like trying then, to. Like, now you're not gonna touch it for a minute, so this will help. Like, hopefully, it firms up a little bit. You know, because um, like right now, I've been touching mine too much. It's starting to get all <laughs> goofy. Um, so I'm gonna take my pot. Well, that bruise wheel just like automatically like brings it to life. And dip this <laughs> into my latex. Yeah. And then I'm going to kind of fill up that area, that negative space. Um, specifically, if you can, depending on the size of your wound, if you can get under that lip, that edge you created at all, um, that helps with both um, reinforcing the wax and like anywhere we're putting this latex gives us a, a, a place to bond some cotton. We don't have to put it over the entire latex area, but I like to make sure we have the option is it okay if it's like on my wax because my yeah that's fine too in fact i mean we only have the time to do one you know one look today but latex on top of the wax is also a thing that people do okay. <laughs> uh it just can help kind of seal it, but it also creates more texture, which means then you can't manipulate the wax anymore as well. What I recommend if you're looking for um, other like resources is look at like the Glam and Gore channel and specifically search for scar wax or liquid latex, and then you'll you know you'll get some examples of other ways to use these products too, because they're pretty standard, universal, awesome thing. So while this is still wet, very wet, um, and take some little cotton shreds, whatever size you need to work with the, the wound you have, and I'm just gonna smush them down in there. It doesn't need to be anything perfect, just needs to be bonded to the latex. Just getting them in there. If it sticks out of your wax at all, you could just pretend that that's intentional. <laughs> Which means, you know, so if you're working on, like when I'm working on a film, 
I have a lot less leeway than I do doing something like this with you guys. If I, you know, because I'm, I'm trying to help the creators um, bring a specific, you know, vision to life that usually has something to do with the story, right? But in this case, we're playing. So if you get some cotton sticking out, like that's okay. It's just going to be more like outpouring goopy mess. Yes, spatula. <laughs> Very useful. Once I have some cotton stuck on there, I'm just I'm just reloading my Q-tip with more latex. I'm just going to smush it on top. Um, I am doing this primarily so that the cotton won't be quite so porous and absorbent. Um, it also really kind of helps like tamp down the puffiness, like the flukiness of the cotton. For certain, for certain looks, I, I might not want to do this top layer of latex, but in general, I think it's a good idea. Um, and you get some cool textures. And I know it's more difficult to see while everything is flesh tone, but you, I've been sort of smushing around in here. You get some neat textures. So when you have done that, you can go ahead and like put your lid back on your latex because we don't want that to dry out. We are not going to be able to put anything um, on top of this latex until it dries. So we want to give that a minute. Um, if I were doing this on set and time is of the essence and it's taken a while, I would use like a blow dryer or a fan, blow dryer on cool only or, or fan. But we're not using blow dryers right now because COVID. So um, I had to do this the other night and I was just fanning extensively. So we want that to dry. While that's drying, if you haven't already done so, you can open up your powder. Because that's going to be our next step. You should be able to see as your latex is drying that it dries darker. So that kind of helps you gauge whether it's like, I can see a darker tone around the edges where it's thinner. Kind of like that cool, you know, purple to a clear school blue or whatever. <laughs> so you will be able to tell visually that it's dry. All right. I'm going to give that a second to dry. Now, while that latex is still drying in the center, in the interest of saving time, we can start powdering around the outside on the, on the wax. Um, two purposes to our powder. One is to reduce shine. Two is to set everything and make it less slick. Right? Latex always sticks to latex. Um, if you've ever bought like a set of elf ears or something from a party store, they're always powdery when you take them out of the package. And that's why, like in the process of, of removing a latex mold, it has to be powdered the whole time, like the entire time it's being removed or else it sticks and it's trash. Um, so anytime we're using latex, always want to powder on top as soon as it's dry. While mine is still dry, I'm just going to powder around on the back. And I don't like to just like hang out while I'm waiting for my latex to dry a little further. So I'm going to go ahead and start using my bruise wheel to work around the outside so that we are not wasting time. Um, if you do accidentally like touch the wet latex with your powder brush, that's okay, but you are going to get like, you're going to have dry gunky latex on your powder brush that you're going to want to clean later. Um, so meanwhile, I'm just gonna go ahead and start doing some bruising around the edges on my wax. 
I'm starting with my yellow and just using my stipple sponge for this right now. Starting with my yellow, because let's say my, my wound is not from like today. So it's starting to heal a, li a little bit, it's real nasty. And I am not taking care of it, so I'm, maybe I'm dead, you know. <laughs> but I'm just stamping on with my stipple sponge. Um, I'm starting on the wax and pulling it out onto my skin as well. This kind of helps with masking that transition from wax to skin. Um, I'm not gonna be using my blue or green for this. I'm gonna be using the yellow and the two reds. So then I'm going to my brighter, lighter red and doing the same thing, coming in a little closer. Like with my yellow, I came out a um, solid probably inch and a half. And with my rosy brighter red, um, I'm doing about half of that right on top of my yellow, allowing the yellow to protrude. Um, I like to blend them a little bit, but be careful not to do too much or you start to lose the texture, which is the whole point of the stippling in the first place. If you like blend too much, you end up with just like a blob of color. And I'm just gonna do uh, one more pass, but with my darker maroon red. And and I'm just kind of looking for areas where I could use a little filling in. Or I feel like the color is a little flat. Right. Isn't it magic? And we haven't even used it for like the paint part. Yeah, as soon as this latex is dry, I'm going to show you a way you can use it with your brushes too. But for, for real, this is like essential. Like, there are other brands that make them, but I, I really, really like the colors in this one. I feel like they're very realistic and very versatile too. I'm not the most happy with the edge on this, but obviously, like, don't have forever to play with it. But um blood will we can cover it up with blood later so if you can see the difference right like we started out with everything being this sort of flesh tone and once you add some bruising it really makes a difference and it's very forgiving it's a great way to hide imperfections or or edges transitional areas um my latex is dry enough to be safe to to mess with so i'm going to powder that And it's okay if some of that gets on the outside. You can always refresh your, your stippling if you feel like it muted your bruising at all. Um, and then you can take your little paint brushes. You probably have a couple of small paint brushes, like a pointier one and a flatter one. Um, I, I'm gonna use a flatter one. It's still small. It depends on which size you're using, whether maybe pointier is better for you. This is where if you have any makeup or fine art or crafting experience, those come in handy. If not, practice makes better for sure, something anyone can learn. But I'm gonna get into my dark blue here first. Um, this navy is the closest thing in this wheel that we have to black, but that's great because most of the time, unless there's like gunpowder involved, black isn't happening in your wounds anyway, right? Um, so I'm getting into the navy and just loading up the brush. Then my first move is gonna be to take this brush right under the wax edges to create sort of a drop shadow. Oh, and it looks like my latex is still a little wet, but I'm just gonna push through and power through this. You don't wanna do the whole deck. But just getting right under, um, I, I like to blend a little as I apply it. Don't spend a ton of time on it unless you have a ton of time. Really just creating some 
art, some extra depth. I know that why, because we have built up this wax edge, we have some real depth. And we're essentially using this as a, this brush and bruise wheel to make an underpainting. Give ourselves some more dimension. So I'm going right underneath both the top and bottom wax edges. with the darkest color. I'm wiping out a little bit for like before I go to the next step, but it's okay if you don't get all the all of the navy off because that's You're just gonna help with blending. And then I'm gonna go in with into my uh, my darker red. And coming out from the edge of that navy, doing the same thing, just applying it with the brush. If your latex is super wet, it's not gonna stick. I have one spot this, that just gave me some trouble that I guess I'm just gonna avoid. So you might need a minute if it's, if it's still super wet or to fan it off. I actually do need to give like half of this interior a little bit more time. Um, so this is a great time to work on some of the edging of the wax. Um, so I'm loading up a brush with some of the rosier bright red. And I'm just gonna wipe that right along the, that rounded edge of wax. None of this area where our skin has been torn it should be a nice, healthy flesh tone, right? Because it's damaged. This rosy red is great for like the more raw and sensitive areas, whereas your deeper red is gonna look more like areas that have bled or have bruised. I don't know. It has it clean Making it a different color. So we just want to, anywhere among this wound that is still fleshy, we want to fix that by messing it up. Everyone's wounds look very realistic. <laughs> oh, good. It's Yay. Yeah. I hope it'll really do freak some people out a little bit. When we do our in-person classes, like I, it, it's a two day thing. So at the end of day one, I'm like, if you're going to go to the grocery store or whatever, like I want to hear all about it tomorrow. And we've heard some fun stories. <laughs> Especially when we did like, preteen summer camps like a, a girl made a baby cry and her mom got mad and she had to clean her face before she left well, after that <laughs> babies are easy to make cry come on that's what I they know, do babies just cry cry that's, that's like fun job. that means the baby is functional <laughs> <laughs> i'm like i'm sorry that quietest i've ever been because i'm so afraid it's gonna fall off oh it's looking good considering that like you had a late start because it was acting up like you've come a long way already I feel like i'm the poster child right now for if i could do it anyone can do it hey if that's <sighs> <laughs> i mean are you generally like crafty or handy very select crafts uh-huh i think I, i'm handier than craftier word Yeah, I mean, these are all skills that, like, again, like, anyone can learn. Some people, like, pick it up faster than others. Um, but even with all the skills, sometimes materials just don't cooperate, and that's life. Um, Faiza and I know from all kinds of experience that there is not, there's, like, not much that's not negatively affected by 110 degree temperature out here every summer. Um, 
in my in my department for sure like things melt and that's not what we want to happen on our bases i might just have to like petition for all horror films to involve melting effects to just make my my, my job easy in the summers you know like in between june and august they have to melt <laughs> Uh, so I feel like this is definitely drier for me than it was a few minutes ago. So I'm going to go ahead and just powder again. I'm just, I'm being careful not to ruin my color. Alrighty. And so I'm going to just continue doing the same thing over that area that I had missed prior because it was wet. Um, I am taking dark and we had already gone along the underside. But anywhere that I see like actual divots and valleys in the texture, I'm just adding more of the dark, They're just to give me more depth. Like I said, consider it like an underpainting. It's like doing cow spots almost. But we are not a cow, we are a wounded human. And then same again with a little bit more of that red. You can still have some of the flesh color exposed here in the interest of saving time. We're doing a quick and dirty version. Doesn't have to be perfect. I can still see some flesh tone through here. Um, so I'm going to do some scabby blood in there next. And I'm going to focus on my scabby blood, on, like placing it into the areas that are the most fleshy right now. Camouflage. So much of this process, it, it, it's intuitive with like what the step before did for you you know if you have a blemish to cover up i just had like a huge blob of scab blood and i'm just like smushing it around to distribute it yours may or may not be a little bit more like small lumps but i'm just using uh, a another q-tip Rather, I'm using the other end because I didn't get latex on both of my ends. But I'm just smushing it around in there and really taking a second to like press it down into those little valleys and any gaps in color. And it should stick pretty well. Like I said, this will eventually dry, it won't remain syrupy but it will still look goofy. You got some texture built in. And once you are happy with a relatively even placement of your scabby blood, you can put in some of the liquid blood. Um, I like to also sometimes just like wipe the excess of my scabby blood like along those edges so you have Interesting. So you're moving on to the other blood. I am going to move on to the to the other blood now. I am I'm pretty happy with this. And then your other blood, like I said, it starts out liquid. It will eventually dry. Uh, totally up to you how much you like. Let gravity help you here. <laughs> I like to let gravity help, but just right. make sure you're prepared if you if you're going to have a drip. Um, you want to put to place the blood inside the wound, right? Like, because that's where it's coming from, and then let it let it sort of move around on its own. If it wants to drip, awesome. If you need to help it, you can use your fine paintbrush to add a, an additional drip. Oh, that's so gross. You love it, like it's super gross. So gnarly. Um, so that's just like, you can use a Q-tip or a paintbrush to apply your liquid blood. Mine isn't gonna do a whole lot of dripping on its own, it looks like. When I want the organic like drip to happen on its own, I, I can just kind of pile up into the areas that, that look like they're most likely to drip once I've seen that happening. So I found a spot that looks like, yeah, it'll drip if I plop it in here. So this looks like it might drip a little. And then one last little tip is if you have any like imperfections, I definitely like don't 
I'm not super happy with this particular transition. Um, blood and a simple sponge make a really great like forgiving um, like cover up. So I can stipple, be more careful, like less is more with blood. I know that's crazy to say. And when we're talking about like a horror look, less is more with the blood, you can always add more blood. Like the worst thing would be is if you spent all this time making this beautiful, nasty wound and then you like doused it in blood and lost all that detail and you can't do anything about it. So a little bit of blood on my stipple to just like stamp down in some areas that I feel like could use a little something. Only if you feel like that makes sense for your look, right? Like it's just an optional additional step you can do. I That's a good drip. I know, it's still going. <laughs> you have the best drip, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Love it. Yeah, so, you know, it's, it's, some of this is personal decisions depending on, again, like what happened here, right? Like if is it a clean surgical wound, you're not gonna have like drips and, and stuff everywhere. You might have bruising, but it'd be very strategic and it would look a lot cleaner than all this. Um, and you certainly wouldn't have the jagged edges and blood all over the place. So, but um, clearly whatever happened to me, not surgical, probably involved some kind of a murderer trying to murder me. And I may or may not have lost that battle. Either way, big hole in my face, you know. Um, but yes, so we use the scar wax to create the, the structure itself. Um, I suppose it makes more sense for there to be as much blood underneath as there is up top. Some of this too depends on like the placement. Um, I did a, a battle thing, a battle shoot um, this week where where the blood went was really dependent upon how the, how the actor was laying. So I waited to add my drips until he was in place on set, right? Because you want it to make sense. But um, there's a lot you can do with this. And I hope that you guys are able to like um, to experiment with it a little bit more and find some other ways to like do different cool looks, but scar wax and liquid latex and cotton and a bruise wheel. Um, those are those and blood, obviously those are essentials that I, I can't, I can't imagine like any effects makeup artist not using some combination of those products on a regular basis. There are a lot of other tools out there to use, but those are, they're easily accessible. Um, relatively easy to learn how to work with, uh, and there's a lot you can do with them. So, yay! My nasty face. I great. love it. Oh, oh yeah. yeah! A little screen grab. I love it. Are you guys going to be posting? Oh, look at you! Are you going to post pictures of your faces on the internet? Absolutely. I am, but I feel bad because I know like at least one person is going to panic. I'm going to walk downstairs and video my family when when I come down and see what happens. <laughs> awesome. So if you were, like, one thing some of, I've seen some of my students do if they're really concerned is they'll do, you know, if you do multiple photos on Instagram, it's a slide, like, swipe through kind of thing. Their first one will just be some graphic they made that's like, this is makeup. Yes. So that before anybody sees the actual look, like, if you really feel like you need a trigger warning. Just that's, a bit of an intense time right now. Yeah. You know, Feels right to give a warning. That's fair. Yeah. Fair. Uh, but my mother will get no such warning, so we'll see. Uh -oh. <laughs> my parents aren't getting a warning right now. <laughs> That's they're gonna, awesome. They're going to be really mad they let me uh, quarantine with them. <laughs> <laughs> I had a student who, I think she was 12 at the time, right? Um, the, her first class, I'm talking about Maya, Teresa, <laughs> her first her first, uh, we were doing, we do summer day camps for youths um, that are a little bit, you know, geared more toward like their age appropriate level of, of horror, I guess. Her first ever class, um, she, or first time ever using scar wax, she made a big gash on her shin. So, she, you know, like a really long gash. And when her mom came to pick her up, she's fun and she was rolling with it. She took a picture of it and sent it to the grandma and was like, Maya had a rough day at camp. We're going to the ER. And the grandma, like, forgot completely that this was an FX makeup camp, you know? And she freaked out. She, like, like was already on the road on her way, you know, calling, like, which hospital are we going to? It was like, whoa, 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 whoa. 
she just did a really good job as makeup. <laughs> so that's a wise yeah. warning to anyone uh, watching: wield your new powers wisely. That's right. Traumatize responsibly, lightly. <laughs> that's right. You never know how people are going to react when they see it. So now that we we all have the warnings, as we wind this down. Would you both mind plugging anywhere that someone needs to go if they want to be able to do this themselves to, to sign up, to get a box and all that good stuff? Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. So our website is austinfilmschool.org. And so when you go to our website, there's actually a front slider just for Play at Home and it has its own landing page. Um, for September, we'll be rolling out some workshops within the next week. And then October we're doing, we're going big for October since it's, Halloween month. Um, and so we'll have a variety of different workshops in October as well. Um, a tip though, is that we do close the workshop a week in advance. So a week before the workshop begins so that we can actually mail you your kit. Um, as of right now, it's only open to us residents because of shipping and customs and all that kind of stuff. But every special effects workshop comes with a specifically curated kit. So we had like one that was sea creatures like Cthulhu. And so like it had different types of uh, tools like gray body paint and like other things. Um, so they're very specific to the workshop. So just just a little bit of information on that. And we do from class to class, like we'll do a coupon code so that you're not paying for like a bruise wheel every single time or whatever. You know, for people who are doing more than one class, we do accommodate making that reasonable, you know? Haley, that blood drip is uncontrollable on you right now. I don't know where it's going. It's going somewhere. It has a mind of its own. You both have a really great drip. Yeah, I'm feeling really good about that drip right now. I'm feeling a whole lot better about this process. So yeah. just in case anybody is out, out there is like freaked out that they can't do it, I couldn't do it at the beginning. And then look where I ended up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you don't even have anybody like physically there helping you you've still figured it out so Haley, i feel like you're naturally more of a pro at this stuff than i am well, i don't know about that i'm just a makeup nerd i watch a lot of youtube man <laughs> but this is my first time actually doing it like i watch glam and gore a lot because she's amazing but uh it's a lot harder <laughs> to use your own sticky fingers mm -hmm. i will agree all right guys thank you so much for walking us through all of this to everybody out there thank you for watching this episode you have officially survived the witching hour.